We're in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Now, I want to give you an outline for the next several weeks because we've come to the actual important beginning of the main message of this great letter. In verses 1, or I should say in chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, God shows us the heathen are guilty before him. The, healthy, the heathen are guilty and under his condemnation. All right, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, the moral man is guilty before God and under his condemnation, and he shows why. So the first, the heathen, why the heathen are guilty. Second, why the moral man is guilty and under God's condemnation. All right? In chapter 2, verse 17, through chapter 3, verse 8, the Lord shows us why the religious man is guilty before him and under his condemnation. So... What you have here are the three categories of the whole human race. And what God shows is why each category is guilty before him and under his condemnation. Now, in chapter 3, verses 9 through 20, God gives us a summation of the condition of the whole world. This is his summation of how he sees all mankind and why. So the Apostle Paul operates here as God's prosecuting attorney. And he brings the whole human race to the bar of God's justice. And he takes up each category of the human race and he begins to show why each category is guilty before God. Now, most of us don't have a great deal of trouble understanding why the pagan, the heathen, is guilty before God. But often we do have a hard time with the moral man. Why is he guilty? After all, he does good and he's morally good. He doesn't cheat, doesn't beat, doesn't cheat the IRS, doesn't beat his wife. Remarkable man. He's moral keeps his word. Why is he guilty before God? Well, that section will show us. And then there's the religious man. You know, the common argument, well, doesn't matter which religion you belong to, just so you're sincere. Well, God shows us the most sincerely religious people that ever lived, the Pharisees. And he shows that there, there is no way the religious man can be accepted with him, and he shows us why. But this whole section be, uh, springs out of verse, verses 16 and 17, which we took up last week, especially verse 17, where it says that in the gospel, a righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. There is a righteousness of God that protects us from the judgment of God. There is only one way to not fall under God's condemnation, and that's to be under his righteousness, to have God's own righteousness. And that is a righteousness that's given by faith. And then he shows the alternative. All right, let's begin in verse 18. Here in verse 18, we have a declaration of God's attitude toward the heathen. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth, literally, by means of unrighteousness. They suppress the truth by means of unrighteousness. Now, you'll often hear 
In fact, if you've ever shared about Jesus Christ with people, then I'm sure that most of you have come up against this argument. The minute you start saying Jesus Christ came and he died for your sins and he is the only way that God has for you to find forgiveness and find acceptance with him. The minute you say that, you will usually get the argument, what about the heathen in Africa? Now, not that they give a hang about the heathen in Africa, but they just want to get you off the track. Now, there may be a few who care and have a genuine problem with that, but there are very few I've found who really had a genuine problem with that. But is the African, let's say, or the aborigine in the center of Australia, or the headhunters in New Zealand, or some of the numerous savage tribes in the Amazon area in South America, are they lost? Are they under God's condemnation? And if they are, is it fair? After all, if you've got to believe in Jesus Christ and accept his gift of forgiveness, what about the Hindu in India? Is he lost? And if he's lost, is it fair? And this is a, a great dilemma because people, some genuinely, I don't want to play down the fact that some genuinely do care and have a dilemma with God. Is it really fair? Can, we know that God must be fair, but how can he be fair and condemn a person who's never heard the name of Jesus Christ? Well, let's see what God himself says about it. First of all, he says, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Now, this word wrath is the word orge in Greek, from which we get the word argy, but it really means a white hot anger. And this expresses God's attitude toward unrighteousness and his hatred of evil. It is not that God is pouring out his wrath on these people. He isn't. He's still kind. He still gives them an opportunity. But it's the fact that he has revealed his attitude toward evil to all men, even those in the most savage, darkest parts of the Amazon or Africa. And God reveals that he hates evil just as passionately as he loves good. You know, if you, if you have a God that doesn't hate evil, then you'd have a God that didn't love good either because you can't have one without the other. To be a just God, he has to hate evil just as fervently as he loves good. That's part of a just nature that's absolute. And so God says he, that he has revealed this. You know how he has? Because even the one that's in the most darkest place on the face of this earth has inside of him a conscience. And man has rationalized that conscience to a alarming degree but nevertheless there still is within us a conscience that tells us that there is a God who hates evil but the heathen according to God suppresses that inner truth by what and by the way it's in the present tense in the original Greek it means who keep on suppressing they hold down this inner knowledge that they can have about the fact that God hates 
evil deeds. They hold it down, how? By means of unrighteousness, that is, by means of their unrighteous behavior. They deliberately suppress this knowledge. Now, in the next two verses, God shows that there are two undisputable witnesses of his existence to all men, no matter where they are, no matter what religion they may have been raised in. There are two undisputable witnesses to the reality of his existence and what he is like. The first is an inner witness, verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident where? Within them. And by the way, the Greek word translated evident here means clearly evident. In other words, it's not something that's obscured, but it says in the heart of every person, there is inside of him this clear evidence in his heart. And so it says, because that which is known about God is clearly evident within them. Why? For God has made it evident. Can you find a better teacher than God? No. God says that he has made what may be known about him, and that is his existence, that he is one true, distinct creator God who is a distinct personality, who is distinct from creation, that he has made it known and he has made it evident within every man's heart. And it's clear. Think back on your own experience. When did you first come to an awareness that there must be a God? Do you remember? I remember when this began to develop in me. I had a clear awareness of God's existence when I was around six years old. I didn't understand, but I had a clear awareness that there must be a God. I remember when I was 12 years old. I wasn't raised in a religious home. I wasn't raised in the church. Didn't go except on rare occasions. But I remember distinctly thinking. I thought a lot as a child. I was alone a lot. And I remember distinctly thinking. God, I had heard in one of my inf infrequent conversations about religion, I'd heard someone say, I think it was on the radio, a pastor, that a child who dies before the age of accountability goes to heaven. And I remember distinctly as a 12-year-old boy saying, Lord, I wished I had died before now because then I would have gone to heaven. Because I figured there was no other way. I figured it was, it was too late now and there'd never be another chance because I'd blown it so badly by the age I was of 12. I figured there was no more hope. And so there is what the Latins call the Imago Dei. The great Latin theologians argued about this Imago Dei is that inner God consciousness. And God sees to it that all of us come to that God awareness, that God consciousness. Now, that's the inner witness. Now look at the outer witness, verse, nine, uh, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been what? Clearly seen. And in the Greek, this word clearly seen means clearly seen with the eye of reason, according to the 
greatest authority on the Greek language, clearly seen with the eye of reason, God's existence. Being understood, and this means to comprehend through what has been made so that they are without excuse. So how does this, uh, this outer witness work with the inner witness? As we grow up, there's this inner witness that there must be one true God. And there is the outer witness of constantly running up against the phenomena of creation about us. Now, I'm going to get a little vehement here. My wife's going to blanch white. A person has to get a great deal of education before he can become stupid enough to explain away the evidence of creation. And it is pure rationalization. And I've heard all of these, you know, sophisticated logic arguments in the classroom. You go into philosophy. By the way, I used to take these religious surveys, I mentioned it probably before, on the UCLA campus. I did that for six straight years. Hundreds of surveys walked up at random, the students, and would take surveys of what they thought about God. And I remember I would go to the humanities quad, to the philosophy quad of the, of the campus, and about 98% didn't believe in God. I'd go to the science quad and about 98% believed in God. The more you get into philosophy, the more blind you get, in my opinion, because it's usually a mental gymnastic used to explain away the obvious. And they usually say, there's no way to logically prove that there is a God. Well, there are five basic arguments that historically have been used to prove God, and they relate, uh, most of them relate to the evidence of creation. And I say, well, maybe you can logic yourself away from the evidence, but I think it's so clear, and God says it's clear. Verse 20, he said that his invisible attributes... His eternal power and His divine nature have been clearly seen with the eye of reason being understood through what? Through what has been made. Do you know that as we have gotten these super powerful telescopes out into space and we've been able to see beyond what we knew before that they're now discovering that there are universes that are greater than all we knew before out there that we never knew existed. As we study the stars, you can navigate by the stars because they're on exact orbits as they go through space. Exact timing, exact paths. What keeps them on those paths? As far as that's concerned, what keeps you from flying off of the face of the earth out into outer space? Gravity. Where'd that come from? That's one of the least understood things in nature. Gravity. What makes it work? You know, anywhere you go in science, you'll find that you come up against the fact that there are intricacies of design, intricacies of things that repeat, of powers at work, that we can study and see how they work, but we don't know certain things why. For instance, in nuclear science, we can get down to the smallest objects and we can't understand why they are bound together. What are the enormous, unbelievable forces that pull the atoms together?
why does the earth continue in its exact orbit around the sun? Just last night, Kim has a peacock feather somebody gave her, a friend of hers in Greece gave her. And all of a sudden, she started looking at it, holding it up to the light. And she burst into praise to God. And I looked over at her. She's an artist. And she said, no one can do this. She says, look at it. These gorgeous blends of colors. And then you turn them a certain way and they shine another color. And she started praising God for his great creativity. And she held it up and she said, and Lord, they say this just happened. Clearly seen by the eye of reason, being understood by what is made. Okay. So God has revealed that he hates evil. God has revealed clearly within us that he exists. God has revealed by the kindergarten, which is the universe, the, the ABCs of learning God is the, is the universe. By the things that are made, he has revealed that he must, there must be one true creator God who is distinct from his creation. Okay, all of that, let's for the moment say all of that is a given. We accept that. Well, then how can this pagan who is out in the middle of a savage tribe, how can this pagan be held responsible for not believing in Jesus Christ? I'll tell you why. The Bible says you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. As Jesus said in John chapter 7, if anyone is willing to do his will, he shall know he shall know. He shall know of me. You see, once any person on this earth, no matter where he or she is, whether he is a Hindu, a Buddhist, a Shintoist, a New Ager, or a pagan, a headhunter, like the Aka Indians that are down in the Amazon. No matter where this person may be, when he comes to God consciousness, if he wants to know that God, if he has a heart response to that God consciousness, God will move heaven and earth to get the message to him. That God promises, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So there's no such thing as a person dying without finding the truth if he really wants to know the God that all men come to know exists within them. It's really fascinating. You know, I was in seminary when the phenomenon of Jim Elliott and the other men that went down to the Alka Indians in the Amazon from Wheaton College. They went as missionaries down there. They went down and they were all killed. Now, I'll never forget the wife of Jim Elliott coming to seminary with the headhunter who had killed her husband and hearing him give his beautiful testimony of how he came to Christ through her going back in there. And she led practically the whole tribe to Christ. And the first one to believe is a young girl 
And when she believed in Jesus Christ, as, as they were talking, she said, you know, as I was growing up, I kept asking the questions, where is the God who created all of these things about me? And I wanted to know him. And God sent someone down to tell him. You know, there have been cases where no missionary ever got there. And when missionaries did get to a, a remote tribe, they found that they had enough of an understanding about God having a son who came and died for their sins and that they had thrown themselves upon the mercy of God, believing that this son paid for their sins. They didn't know his name, but they knew what he did and they had accepted his forgiveness. No one will ever be saved by being ignorant and believing that there's animal sacrifices or their various religions will save them. No, the Bible says that will never save anybody. But they can be saved by coming to this God consciousness, desiring to know God, and God will reveal to that one, even if he has to do it supernaturally, he will reveal to them that there has been a provision for their sins and they can be forgiven only by accepting that. There, there are cases that show that. So what about the heathen? They're lost. But God has a witness to them and if they respond to this inner God consciousness, God will move to bring and if he has no missionaries that can be brought there, then God himself will stand in the gap. But that's only in extreme cases. God sends us out. That's why people go to the mission field, because the moving of the Holy Spirit comes along, and he brings them in. There are so many. I, I think of uh, a man that has spoken here on many occasions, the man who formerly was a Hindu guru. How he thought he was a god. And yet God broke through and brought him to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You see, religion is a blinder. We'll see that in our next section. Religion is truly a blinder. It blinds people to the truth. But God is able to break through if in the man's heart he's truly looking for God. Many people use religion simply as, uh, well, the way others would use drugs, escape. But there are some in these religions that are truly looking for God. And if they are, God will reveal the truth to them. All right. We're going to trace the decline of mankind. Actually, this shows a historical decline of man from the original knowledge he had of God, but this is something that is applicable to every culture. There are three steps in the decline and the destruction of culture. And those three levels of decline, levels of disintegration within culture are traced here and it keeps repeating itself in history, in each culture. In verse 21 it says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So the first, actually the first destruction of a society is when they knew God and they start pushing that knowledge away. And 
And what will always happen in that case is idolatry. First, it will go to a worship of man, then of an image of man, then to an image of animals, and they will prostrate themselves before these images. And then in verse 24, the result of that, and there are three deliveries that God does, and each one of these things are very terrifying. The result of that pushing the knowledge of God that was there out of the collective consciousness, pushing it out of a culture, is verse 24, the first delivery. Therefore God gave them over and the lust of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth for, of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So this happened in, in the initial history of man. It happens over and over again in, in various nations and cultures. God gives them over to the lust of their heart, to impurity. This means that there, is, there becomes a rampant sexual impurity. You'll find in the ancient heathen religions, the pagan religions, that they practiced sexual immorality along with their false worship. In fact, in Corinth was the center of this that spread throughout the Roman world, and that was the temple of Aphrodite. The temple priestesses were prostitutes. And there became this rampant sexual immorality so that their bodies were dishonored among them. And they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. The, this is the place where when God is rejected, there has to be an alternative to God erected, a lie. And you know, you can trace this decline in the history of the United States, just as you can trace it in the history of other nations that have disappeared from the scene of history. United States began to push away a knowledge of God that was almost unique in history because the founders of this country, though they were not all Christian, were spearheaded and driven on by a body of people who were fleeing religious persecution in Europe and they brought with them a passion to establish a nation where there would be freedom of religion and freedom to pursue not just religion, but Jesus Christ, the backbone of the settling of this country were those who were pursuing faith in Jesus Christ. Now, we can see when that began to wane in the early 20th century, and the knowledge of Christ began to, be, began to be pushed out. And evolution began to be one of the substitutes for God, a, re a reason not to believe in the Creator God, a way to explain Him away. And you can see the decline sat in heavily the late 19th and early 20th century in the United States. And this decline goes on in verse 26. It says, because they exchanged this, there became rampant sexual immorality, and they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. For this reason, God gave them over. Now, this is the second delivery of, of destruction of a culture. God gave them over to degrading passions. For the women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Now, you know, there's a big thing today, even among the churches, which say that homosexuality is an alternate, acceptable lifestyle. As a matter of fact, I was just listening with amazement a couple of days ago to the news where 
a certain man couldn't be confirmed as a government official because he had said some derogatory remark about homosexuality. And I've heard ministers say that we can accept homosexual, homosexuals in the church as ministers Because the Bible does not condemn it. That was an old wives' tale. Tell me what this is saying. Women exchange the natural use exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. In the same way also men abandon the natural function of woman of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men, committing indecent acts. Now, what is that describing? Is that describing friendship? No, this is describing lesbianism and homosexuality. And God says that this is a sure sign that a country is on the skids toward destruction when that becomes an acceptable lifestyle. Now let me be quick to hasten. God loves and I love the lesbian and the homosexual. And I have great compassion for them. And Jesus Christ loved them so much, he died for them just like he died for me, a sinner. And salvation and forgiveness and all that God offers through Jesus Christ is available to the lesbian and the homosexual. And though their sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be made like wool. All of those promises are for them too. But in no way does the Scripture say that God can condone that they continue in that lifestyle. It's an abomination. It is a sign of the dis of the culture and the nation about to be destroyed when it's accepted as a normal lifestyle. That is the second decline and delivery of God toward destruction, and it means destruction is very near. And the United States has accepted it now officially as an acceptable lifestyle. And we are as a nation in great danger. And many denominations now have accepted it as an acceptable lifestyle. Some have been ordained to the ministry. Now, mark you, I'm not saying that a former homosexual who has repented and who through the power of the Holy Spirit has victory over this can't be a minister. I'm saying one who continues to practice it cannot be a minister any more than a whore can be forgiven and continue to be a whore and be ordained to the ministry. It is an abomination. And the acceptance of this, the toleration of it, the idea that this can be continued is an abomination before God, and God will destroy the culture that does this. Don't believe it? Look at the cultures of the past history. The Carthaginians, for instance. Even the wicked Romans, when they captured Carthage, blushed when they saw the kind of debauchery and sexual perversion that was at Carthage. Of course, later the Romans went into all of this, and they just disintegrated from moral perversion and degeneracy. They just disintegrated as a culture. They fell apart. 
But listen to what it says. In the same way, verse 27, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men, committing indecent acts. Now, receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. What does that mean? Let me read you from this latest issue of Time magazine. It says, and I quote, More than any measures, however health officials at every level are pleading for what is very nearly a social revolution, says U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary Otis R. Bowen, I can't emphasize too strongly the necessity of changing lifestyles in the United States. Continuing, many people dealing with the absolute death sentence that AIDS imposes considered a vague sort of retribution in Old Testament-style revenge, says a Los Angeles entertainment writer, sexual disease has been around for thousands of years. It reappears when monogamy breaks down. AIDS pushes monog monogamy right back up there on the priority list. End of quote. So what this is saying is that Historically, whenever rampant sexual perversion took place, whenever morals broke down and sexual promiscuity broke out, you know what would happen? There would always be some kind of a plague of venereal diseases. In the past, syphilis, gonorrhea, things like this. But medically... We overcame all of those. And then there was the sexual revolution of the 1960s that became so full-blown that the most incredible orgies took place among normal citizens. Things that I discover even now. I mean, I can't believe the wife swapping and the things that have taken place among people that I would never have believed it, just looking at them, talking with them. Sexual promiscuity has become so rampant that it's, it even, you know, I'm no prude. I mean, I was a tugboat captain. I lived in New Orleans. So I knew all of that side and have known it. But I'll tell you, even I, was I, I couldn't believe some of the things that I've heard that were practiced and are being practiced today. And, you know, with the invention of the, the pill, the invention of all of the ways of preventing pregnancies, and besides, if you slip up, you can always murder your child with a barson. And so with all of this and, you know, a curing of the age-old plague of the venereal diseases, promiscuity just went rampant. And homosexuality has gone rampant, with homosexuals taking over whole cities like San Francisco. And it was thought that there was no retribution, there was nothing to fear. As one of the uh, novelists, Erica Jean, quote, who wrote Fear of Flying, formerly the high priestess of sexual abandonment, put the dilemma succinctly, quote, it's hard enough to find an attractive single man without having to quiz him on, his hit, on their history of bisexuality and drug use. She said, I think I'll become a celibate, end of quote. You know, here's the problem. Since this promiscuity was going wild, all of a sudden, a, a sexually transmitted disease that's never been known before popped up. AIDS is something that has never been known in history. And it only became identified in 1981. 
And now it is spreading like wildfire. And according to this article, it says the frightening thing is that there could be as many as 2 million people who are infected with AIDS in the United States and don't even know they're infected. And they're continuing to spread it because long before you know you've got it, you can spread it. When I interviewed one of the six authorities in the world on AIDS, that interviewed him on my radio show, he said the nation that does not take strong measures to curb the spread of AIDS and the infected ones to, to isolate them will cease to exist as a nation in 20 years. Did you hear that? will cease to exist as a nation. The population will be that decimated. In, the light, in this Time magazine, another thing was said, AIDS is being compared now to the bubonic plague that wiped out 25 million people in Europe in the Middle Ages. It says this, quote, Yet, as the AIDS death toll climbs and statisticians project its probable course into the next decade, comparisons with history's greatest killers begin to make sense. If we can't make progress with faith, we face the dreadful prospect of a worldwide death toll in the tens of millions a decade from now, warned Health and Human Services Secretary Otis Bowen at a recent gathering of the National Press Club. Such earlier epidemics as typhus, smallpox, and even the bubonic plague Black Death will look very pale by comparison. He continued, you haven't read or heard of anything yet, end of quote. Now, I believe that God has permitted this plague as a judgment against all sexual promiscuity, where God's laws have just been thrown astray. And God's, it says, God's wrath is revealed from heaven against these sorts of things. We are in a stage where I believe God's about to judge this country and, and all of Western culture, as well as the whole world, because I believe Armageddon is coming. When you get something as wide as this, I believe the culture of the whole world is coming up for judgment before God, and I believe that's why the tribulation that will last a seven, year, a seven years and almost wipe out the population of the earth, I believe that's why it's coming in very soon. And I believe that's why Jesus Christ is coming even sooner. Jesus, Jesus said he would come for his church before this awful period. You know, I used to talk about the birth pangs that Jesus called signs that would show his coming was very near. And people would really mock me when 20 years ago I would say, Jesus said there would be plagues. And they thought, oh, come on, Hal, in the age of modern medicine, plagues? I'm not going to be any more plagues. We're about to witness the greatest plague in the history of the world. It's already on the earth, and that's AIDS. I believe that that's going to increase in frequency and intensity, just as all of the other signs have increased. Earthquakes, famine. Wars and rumors of wars. International revolution. Plagues. Strange signs in the atmosphere. False prophets. False religions spreading. I believe that we're seeing all of this come together right now. And so God says in verse 28, the third delivery. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Now what, this is the most fearsome 
terrible delivery of God of all. But it's because God says, because they didn't see fit to acknowledge me anymore. In other words, because a nation or a culture would push God's, the knowledge of God so much out of the culture, they didn't even want to acknowledge his existence anymore. And we see that in the world today. We see that in this country. And God says, here's what he does. Since You notice in each case, God gives men, it's not that God forces men to do these things, it's man is pulling to get away from the influence of God, and so fa God finally stops restraining and gives them over to their own depraved minds. And that's what the third delivery is. It says God gave them over to a depraved mind. And the Greek word here translated depraved means, well, you know, the slang expression is a mind that can't think straight. He gives, he gives man over to a mind that can no longer think rationally, that can no longer come up with rational conclusions about the obvious, especially as it's related to God and to the real important things of life. You know, I look at this country and I don't think of myself as having some great intelligence, but I look at the foreign policy of this country. I look at the way there are clear and apparent dangers, threats, from communism moving all over the globe, Nicaragua is a clear and apparent danger. Any idiot can see it. And just reveal, you know, the same media that says there's no problem comes out this morning with there are a lot more Cubans there than we thought there were. And yet we have men in our Congress who now dominate it who make decisions that involve whether we're going to survive as a people or not, that clearly are irrational in the light of the danger that's obviously in front of us. Danger that could easily be overcome and avoided if steps were taken now. Avoided without a war. But they can't think straight anymore. because I believe God has finally given this nation over to our own heart, to a mind that can no longer make rational, logical evaluations. But especially, I believe he's given us over to the passion to just put God out. We have barred God from the schoolroom. We have barred God from public life. We've tried to push any witness of Jesus Christ even out of, you can't even put up a manger scene without a major battle. After the light that God has given this country, though this process is repeated in many countries and they have faded from history and been destroyed, I believe there'll be a greater destruction for this country. Billy Graham has said so rightly, if God doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. We're headed for it, but thank God. The righteousness of God is available to anyone who will accept the gift of forgiveness. And this means whether you're a homosexual a lesbian, an immoral person, a murderer, and I've been guilty of murder in my heart. And before I was a Christian, I was guilty of a lot of things I'd hate to admit to right now. But you know something? He who knew no sin was made sin for us.
in order that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. No matter how far out you may be or have been, the Bible says that Jesus Christ took the wrath for every rotten sin you've ever committed. And he died for it. So that he can take your sins, he takes them and he says, okay, I've already paid for them, give them to me. And then he puts around you as a cloak his own righteousness. He clothes you with a righteousness that's equal to God's that he purchased by his own death for you. And right now, you can accept that. And no matter what lifestyle you may be in, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I will give you a new heart with new desires, and I myself will come to dwell in you and give you the power to live the way I want you to live. If you're in doubt where you stand with God, Will you simply pray and ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and accept his forgiveness? Right now. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, first of all, I pray for our nation. I thank you, Lord, that there is a believing remnant in this country, a strong believing remnant. And I pray that you will continue to give power to all of those who know you. And Lord, I pray for all of those who are believers and they have things in their past that have plagued them, that have been like tightly hidden skeletons in the closet. Lord, may they just simply confess these things and claim your forgiveness. Thank God that you don't hold our sins against us. Thank you that you don't remember our sins. You cast them behind your back and you don't remember them anymore. I thank you that you've said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, Lord, I know that's the only reason I can stand here. And, Lord, lift the burden of guilt from every heart. Though you hate evil, you love those who have placed faith in your son, Jesus Christ. They're accepted in the beloved, and there is no need to carry guilt about the past, nor to fear the future, for you have the power to give them victory. May those victories be claimed right now. May every sin of the past that comes to mind be confessed right now. And Father, I pray for that one who is here and doesn't know whether he or she has been forgiven, doesn't know you, doesn't know whether he is in your family. May that one pray, pray this prayer right now and accept the gift of eternal life. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for dying for me. Please come into my life. I accept the gift of forgiveness. I confess I can't be good enough to please a holy God. So I receive your pardon. Lord Jesus, change my heart. Make my life pleasing to you. Thank you for coming in as you promised. And thank you for eternal life. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.